Hi, my name is Bruce Bouquet, and I'm from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Welcome to Numerical Methods, How to Use Computers to Solve Difficult Math Problems. In this episode, we'll discuss some of the preliminaries that students should learn about before really delving into numerical methods. And here we're going to focus on error and various values that one gets for error the sources, how errors might arise, and then we'll discuss how to address these errors in certain cases. First of all, in order to address error, we have to know what the error is. So when we're doing a computation, we're going to end up with an approximate value for whatever it is that we're trying to solve for. That's what we call x approximate. That's the co computed value that we get. And often, there is the true value that we really desire. The error is the true value minus the approximate value. The absolute error is just the absolute value of this error. The relative error, that's the absolute error divided by the true value of the error. This all should be in absolute values. And finally, the percentage error is this relative error times 100%. So if the true value were 1,000 and our approximate value were 900, the error would be 100. The absolute value would be the same. And the relative error would be 100 over 1,000, or 0.1. And the relative error is therefore 10%. When we're dealing with computations, we often will present our results, and we really don't want to present or make our results look like they are better, or worse for that matter, than they really are. We should try to present them to the number of significant digits that we're confident about. So if the error, the absolute error, is less than 5 in the m plus first digit, then the approximate value has at least m digits of accuracy. So in these cases, uh, we have some examples. If our approximate value is 0.222, but the true value is 2 ninths, which is 0.222222, etc., then the first three values are correct, and therefore we have three significant digits. We don't count leading zeros in our count of significant digits. Uh, in the second case, we see that four of the digits are correct. And so we could say that there are four significant digits of accuracy. Uh, if we are approximating pi by 22 sevenths, 3.1428, etc., true value of pi is 3.1415, etc. So we see that we have three values, three digits of accuracy. <coughs> Where might error arise? Well, there are at least five sources of error. First of all, our model might not include all of the physics that's going on. Maybe we have a model for gravitational pull or the force on an object that, say, dropped from an airplane. Well, if we only include gravity, we might not be including the drag. And maybe the drag is important. Maybe it's not. Depends on the situation. But in terms of our modeling, we could almost never include all the true physics. So. We have to wonder if the terms that we are neglecting are really allowed to be neglected. Will they matter? Another source of error is blunders and mistakes. Often when we're using computers, we make coding errors. It's not always easy to find the coding errors, but in order to convince oneself that your code is good, some of the things that you can do are to test known cases, maybe with parameters for which you know the true values, or to work simple cases by hand and make sure that the computer is giving the same values. Obviously, the reason that we're using a computer is because it's very hard to do by hand. It's very tedious. But if we spend the time testing our code as best we can, we can have more confidence in the results that the computer code gives. Then there's physical me measurement error. Maybe the inputs to our computer code are not exactly correct. Sometimes we get data from the literature, but we're not always certain that that data is correct. Maybe it's off in further digits. Maybe we don't understand it correctly. Maybe there are typos. Uh, maybe we did a an experiment and averaged the results of various experiments to get our physical input value. But maybe there are some error bars on that. So our parameters might not always be exact. And if the uh, physics that you're modeling is, is sensitive to those initial values, or if, you know, you're, if, or if your numerical computation 
method is sensitive to those values, you have to be aware of that and to try to understand what impact it might have on your results. Then there's machine error. We'll discuss more of that. Chopping, whether we're chopping after a certain number of digits, whether you're doing rounding, whether after many, many calculations, maybe you have a very long calculation, maybe in that case, there's a buildup of errors. And then there's the mathematical approximation errors. Maybe we're trying to have a discrete derivative, or maybe we're approximating some function by its Taylor series, and we're only taking a certain number of terms. So there are mathematical approximation errors, terms we're neglecting. And so these are some of the sources where error might arise. Let's talk a little bit about computer rounding. Well, we can't store an infinite number of digits on a computer, so our computer might round the values, or they might just chop it off after however many digits it's saving. So suppose we had a calculation that gives a result of 40, that the 40 is the answer, and we are told that there's two digits of accuracy here. Well, if we know that the number was ra a rounded result, that means that the number must be between 39 and a half and 40 and a half. That's why it was rounded to 40. However, if we just chopped the number after two digits, then we know that the value, the true value is between 40 and 41. In the first case, 40 is within one half a unit of the true value. And in the second case, the error might be as much as one unit. So typically, chopping can have twice the maximum error than rounding might have. So rounding is better if you can do it. Um, we should also note that computers save numbers that we think of as in base 10, but they're using base 2. So if you write a code that says something like, while x is not equal to 1, and you're doing some counting, say, by 0.1, x is 0.1, then it's 0.2, and you keep adding 0.1 to x, it might not notice that x is equal to 1, exactly 1, at a certain point, because it's storing it as, an, as a base 2 expansion. And there's some rounding that's involved in that. And so uh, it might not know that the number is exactly 1. So we have to be careful in our coding and as to how we do these kinds of things. Uh, so some of the errors that might come up to think about when you're doing computations. Uh, the first two examples have to do with what are called indeterminate forms in Calc 1. In the first case, if x is a large number, what you have is a large number x times a very small number. The square root of a large number plus 1 minus the square root of that same large number is very, very small. So we have something going to infinity times something going to 0. And if we're trying to do that on a computer, we may well be losing digits when we perform this subtraction. And then when we multiply by a big number, maybe the answer is a number on the order of 1, but since we lost so many digits in this first place, then uh, our result may be pretty lousy. You might try this by plugging in x equal 1, x equal, say, 100, x equal 10,000, x equal a million, uh, and hold only, let's say, six places, six digits at each stage of your calculation, and you'll see how your errors uh, or the number of significant digits that you're able to be confident about changes. One of the things that you could do in this case is to rationalize the numerator, and then you can get a more stable calculation. Here's another example. We have a quantity that's going to 0 over 0. Dividing by 0 always is going to be problematic. If your numerator is very close to 0 and your denominator is very close to 0, then numerical issues may well arise because we're taking 1 minus a value that's very close to 1. That cancellation can cause problems, and then we're dividing by a very small number. The way to deal with this problem, this second problem on the page, is to consider the Taylor series for cosine x and to do some analytical work before going on. A third example has to do with finding or computing e to the minus 5. If you use the Taylor expansion for e to the x, what we're doing is we're adding and subtracting pretty big numbers. The numbers only start going down 
in the sixth term, and then they are alternating and going down somewhat slowly. So there's a lot of cancellation going on, and if you try doing this calculation and only saving, say, four or five digits at each step, you're probably going to get a lousy result. A way to deal with that problem may be to look at e to the minus 5 as 1 over e to the fifth, and then you don't have any subtraction cancellation in the denominator. So the idea to keep in mind is that if you have a sum and that the result is going to be smaller than many of the terms in its computation, you often will lose digits. And that's really what's happening in all three of these cases. You're de dealing with subtraction, and you're going to lose digits. Other error issues that you want to be aware of is the buildup of error. If you're doing many calculations and you have a certain error after each step, then, for example, if you're adding, then the maximum error that you might get after many steps is simply the number of terms that you're adding up times the maximum error in each term if the maximum error is the same. Uh, with rounding, then your error tends to grow randomly because some of your errors may be positive, some may be negative, so they'll grow usually uh, like a square root of the number of terms you have, whereas with chopping, it will grow something like n, if you have n terms, times the maximum error on each of your terms. The other issue is dividing by zero or having small denominators. If your numerator is a difference of large but close values, then the relative error can become large when you divide, again, because you're losing digits as you go on. If you have a function that you're modeling that's very sensitive to the input values, then you may get lousy results if your input is not exactly right. If we just do a Taylor expanse or a linear approximation, we have that f of x approximate is f of x true plus the derivative at x true times, that should be a multiplication, times x approximate minus x true. Uh, and so if the derivative of the function is very large, then your approximation may be quite different than the function value at the true value of x. Okay, Once again, this should be a multiplication sign. If you're summing many values in order to get a result, then you should sum from the smallest to the largest, even though that might be kind of counterintuitive. You're getting your, if you're just approximating a bunch of, uh, a sum of a bunch of numbers, it might be best to consider the largest numbers first. But if you're really trying to get as close a result as you want, computationally, if you work from the smallest to the largest, you'll be able to save the most number of digits of significance. Finally, we'll tell a story. There were three scientists, an engineer, a physicist, and a mathematician who were traveling through the jungles of South America. And even though they were cautious, they were captured by a tribe of cannibals. After much discussion, the chief of the tribe said, it is our custom to kill anyone whom we capture in our territory. And, but since you are from another land, we give you a choice. We're going to be very nice and generous. You may make one last statement. If we think that your statement is true, we'll boil you in oil. If it's if deemed false, if we think your statement is false, we will chop you into small pieces. So the engineer said, you're serious? And they were. So they boiled him in oil. The physicist said, you people are delinquents. Well, the tribe certainly didn't think that was true, so they chopped him into small pieces. So the mathematician thought for a moment, and finally he said, you will chop me into small pieces. I'm Bruce Bouquet from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Thanks for joining us, and may the power of math be with you.